So welcome back to two services. You got a little bit more room in here, and I uh, actually had quite a packed house in the uh, 915 service this morning, so thank you so much for that. And thank you, Alex, for, uh, for stepping in. Uh, Mitchell, who's been up here the last month or so in front when uh, Josh and Kimmy went back to college, uh, Mitchell went ahead and got married yesterday. And so uh, him and his bride, Abby, are, I'm guessing, halfway to Hawaii uh, by now. So we thought, you know what, okay, take the next two Sundays off, and then, you know, we'll put you back to work here in a little bit. So before I get into um, the message today, I just want to draw your attention to this um, piece of paper that was handed out to probably most of you on the way in here. Um, please know that um, we didn't give you this piece of paper uh, for you to uh, leave it behind in your seat when you leave here today. Um, we didn't give you this piece of paper to help you start a fire in your home as the weather gets a little bit cooler. Uh, but we gave you this to make it as easy as possible to know um, what's taking place around Bridgepoint Church and how you can get involved. And uh, so on one side of the piece of paper, all of the different small groups and Bible studies that are kicking off here in the fall uh, are listed on there. And then the other side is all of the different service opportunities. And this is one of the beauties of two services. It's a little more difficult when we have one service in the summer, but in two services, you can serve in one service and still come and worship in the other service, and you don't miss out on anything that's taking place on a Sunday morning. So I don't know how else to say it other than just to say it. We need you. We need your help. We, we want you in a small group. We need you to get involved and to serve in some way, shape, or form here at Bridgepoint Church because you get so much out of serving the Lord and serving other people here at Bridgepoint Church. So you, you've got to remind yourself that as the body of Christ, and especially if you call Bridgepoint home, we don't show up to church on a Sunday morning to be served. We show up to serve. And so look at that. Prayerfully consider this. If you know where you want to get plugged in, you can check that box and leave it at the Welcome Center on the way out. If you want to take this with you and pray over it, bring it back. All right? Bring it back and, and mark out um, just some way to get plugged in to what's taking place around Bridgepoint Church, and we would appreciate that so very much. So we're going to start a brand new teaching series today where we're going to start a journey uh, through the book of Acts. And so I don't know if you have a physical Bible that you bring with you to church or not. Um, if you do, feel free to go ahead and grab that little ribbon that's in your physical Bible and go ahead and place it there in the book of Acts because we're going to be here for a long time, all right? So you're going to know each and every week where we're going to be if you go ahead and just mark it each and every week um, that you're here. So not only is the book of Acts, as you can see in your Bible, technically called the Acts of the Apostles, but you could probably also call the book of Acts the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going to be the, the prominent figure, the third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is going to be the prominent, dominant person in the book of Acts. And we're going to see that played throughout the book of Acts. So last fall, my friend Grant, um, who pastors in North Carolina, was, was here and he preached for us. And uh, this last summer, um, our paths crossed, and I was at his church in North Carolina in July preaching for him, and he gave me this cannonball. And, and this is like legit, like, like it's heavy. Like if I threw this, it's going to knock somebody out. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. And um, I'm like, what is that? He goes, well, I, I gave it, I gave one to every single person on my staff, whoever preaches Sunday morning, Sunday night, all the services they have, I give them one of these that they have on their desk. I'm like, okay, why? He said, well, this cannonball, yes, we can pick it up, and yes, I'm not going to, but we could chuck it at somebody, and if it hits you upside the head, it's going to do a little bit of damage. But 
in order for it to serve the purpose that it was created to serve, it needs to be shot out of a cannon, okay? More power, more results. I said, okay, that's great, Grant. Thank you. Um, I don't have a cannon. I'm not going to get a cannon. Like, so what does that really mean? He says, I, I have this. All of my guys have it on their desk to remind them that when they're studying the word of God, when they're preparing for a sermon, as I look at it in my office before I leave to come in here, that yes, I could stand up here in front of you and I could preach a message in my own power. I could do that. But in order for the message to be as effective as it can possibly be, that's not gonna be done in my own power. I need to tap into the power of the Holy Spirit of God in order for that message to be most effective. So this sits on my desk and this serves as a reminder that I can't do it on my own because I don't ever want to stand up in front of you and be totally dependent on what I can do, on how I think, on what I know. I want to constantly get to the point where I stand in front of you and I get out of the way and I stay out of the way and I let the Holy Spirit of God do what only the Holy Spirit of God can do. And so this is what we're going to see throughout the book of Acts, the role of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, one if not the most popular verses in the entire book of Acts, and not just Acts, but maybe even in the Bible, is Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. So let's start there, and then we'll, we'll go back to the beginning. So before Jesus ascends back into heaven, he says this, but you will receive power. Everybody say power. power. All right, now the rest of you say power. power. Okay? Everybody's saying, I got the power. Man, yes, I, I was so disappointed. I was so nervous. I'm like, nobody's going to do it. And you did. And just like they did in the first service. Thank you for making my day. But anyway, this is what he says. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Folks, there's power made available to every single person who claims the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. There's power. It's nothing to be afraid of. It's nothing to be embarrassed about. And we're going to reference this, and we'll explain some things along the way, and we'll talk more about that verse later. But we're going to do our best to cover the first 11 verses of chapter 1 today. But before we get into God's word, would you, would you join me in a word of prayer as we ask the Holy Spirit to do what only the Holy Spirit can do? So God, we come before you today, and Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to gather, and we thank you for the opportunity to open up the word of God. And God, my prayer is that not just our eyes and not just our ears, but our minds and especially our hearts will be open to the teaching of the word of God today. And Lord, may it not even just be something that we agree with or that we're taught, but God, may it be something that we put into practice as we leave here today. We thank you for the truth of the word of God and how relevant it is and how powerful and life-changing it is. So God, please do what only you can do. And we will thank you in advance for what's going to come out of this service. And we ask all these things in the name of your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So here's the, here's the main idea for today. And this begins to provide framework um, for the book of Acts and where we're going to go in the book of Acts. Here's the main idea. The mission of Jesus needs to be our mission. The mission of Jesus needs to be our mission. So as followers of Christ, if you claim to be a follower of Christ, if Jesus is your Lord, if Jesus is your Savior, his life becomes our life. It has to happen that way. And if his life is our life, then his mission needs to be our mission. And this mission, it's not just my mission 
as an individual. It's our mission as the local church. And we're going to see this be established and we're going to see this take off moving forward. So basically, the things that were important to Jesus should be important to me. It should be important to us if they're important to Jesus. So we're calling this series, Acts, The Movement Begins, because we have a job to do. This movement, this mission is going to be our mission. And it's something that continues to need to move forward, not just individually, but together as a church. So today I want you to see two things. Two things that are so important from these verses that, that, that we cannot miss in regards to the importance here of the book of Acts. Here's number one. Continuance matters. Continuance matters. And here's what we're going to see in the first five verses of Acts chapter one. That the mission of God through Jesus by the way of the Holy Spirit continues. Now you may say, Craig, why are you confusing me already? Because you said the series is, is the movement begins, but now you're talking about how it continues. Yeah, our role, our responsibility here in the book of Acts, the mission begins. The mission has already begun in the Gospels. The mission has already begun in and through the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what we're going to see here in Acts is that the author is just going to record what Jesus continues to do. His mission continues. Our mission begins as followers of Jesus Christ and as the church. So in, in verse 1, we're going to see the first of three things that show continuity. And it's so important. We're going to see the record of Jesus' teachings and his ministry continues even though he's about to ascend into heaven. Look at verse 1. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. So whoever the author is, and we'll talk about that shortly, whoever Theophilus is, and we'll talk about him shortly, from the very first book, or excuse me, from the very first verse in the book of Acts, we get this idea that Acts is actually a sequel to another book. That Acts is the second volume of a two-volume set of books of the Bible. The first book being that Luke is the author is referencing, gave away, gave away, okay. The first verse just referenced the first book. What is that first book? The book of Luke. The book of Luke is the first volume of this two-volume set, and the book of Acts is the second one. You may say, how do you know that? Because it says it in the book of Luke. <laughs> because he addresses this same person that he addresses here in the book of Acts. Now, what we find is the record of Jesus' ministry and his teaching, it starts in the book of Luke, and it's just going to continue in the book of Acts. So make no mistake about it, church. Jesus' life, his ministry, his teachings, everything he did for us, all of that is recorded in the Gospels. It's recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I, I mean, it's that important. We have to make sure that we understand that. And what we're going to see here in the book of Acts is that Jesus Christ never stops being the focal point for believers. That even though he's going to ascend back into heaven, he's still the focal point. And here we are a couple thousand years later, and guess what? Jesus Christ is still the focal point for all believers. Like that doesn't change. It, it just continues to be revealed. So he's going to ascend back into heaven later on in this chapter. And what Luke is saying here is that what I began in the first book, Luke, I'm going to continue in the second book, Acts. Now, we, I've already let the cat out of the bag, all right, that Luke is the author of the book of Acts. Dr. Luke. He's referred to as a physician. And, and, and even if you read the gospel account of Luke, 
it's written in a different way than Matthew and Mark and John because of what Luke was familiar with. And so that's obviously going to change his perspective. Here's what you need to know about Luke. Luke was a Gentile. And Luke is the only Gentile who ever wrote a book of the Bible, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, but he's the only Gentile to ever write a book of the Bible, and he wrote two, Luke and Acts. And it just continues to talk about Jesus. Who is Theophilus? I have no idea. How's that for an answer? Actually, we do know a little bit, okay? We know that Luke addresses the book of Luke to Theophilus. We, we know that here he addresses the book of Acts to Theophilus. Um, maybe Luke led Theophilus to Christ. Many people think that Theophilus is a, is a government official because when Luke does address him in Luke chapter one and verse three, he refers to him as the most excellent Theophilus. And that was a term that was reserved for people in governmental authority positions. Now, the name Theophilus is pretty cool. It means a friend of God or loved by God. I think that's pretty cool. So those of you, if you're in, in the middle of a, a pregnancy and you haven't quite picked out the name you know, for your child and you want to roll with Theophilus and we can go with Theo, okay, if you want to, I think that's pretty cool because it means an awful lot. It's a very special name. Now look at the next two verses, verses two and three, because these verses begin to clue us in on something very important. Verse two, until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So one of the things that we're going to continue to see in the book of Acts are the specifics of Jesus's ministry and his teachings. The specifics about what Jesus did and how he went about doing those particular things. So what are some of those specifics? In verse two, we see that he's given the disciples commands, that he's revealing things to the disciples. How does he do this? Look at the verse. Through the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Keep reading. He had presented himself alive to them. How? By many proofs, evidence, and he was speaking about the kingdom of God. So all of what we just read summarizes Jesus's teachings in a nutshell. Well, like all of these things we just talked about that we will talk about can be summarized. This is what Jesus taught. This is how Jesus taught. So all of these can be summarized using these terms. Go ahead and put those terms up there if you would, please. Those five, five words. Revelation, power, audience, proof, and response. All of these things are always included when Jesus is teaching someone. When Jesus is teaching his disciples, when Jesus is teaching others, which we're going to talk about here in a second. So let's make our way through this list. He's always revealing, he's always presenting truth, and most of the time he was revealing something in regards to two subjects. Most of Jesus' teaching either included him talking about revealing truth about the kingdom of God, number one. When you, when you study the parables, right, the kingdom of God is like this, and the kingdom of God is like this, and this, and this. There's all these comparisons to the kingdom of God in the parables. So his revealing truth had to do with the kingdom of God, but then he was also always revealing truth about himself. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So his revealing of truth, he was either revealing truth about the kingdom of God or revealing truth about himself. How did he do this? By and through the power of the Holy Spirit. So I'm here to tell you that even Jesus Christ was anointed with and empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. 
This is how he's teaching people, okay? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. To who? Who's the audience? Well, if you read the gospel accounts, most of the time there's two groups of people. One group of people that he's always revealing truth to are his disciples, right? He spent more time with his disciples than anybody else. He's always revealing truth to his disciples, whether they understood it or not. So one group of people is his disciples, but there's another group of people that make up the audience. And sometimes those disciples are mixed with a larger group of people. You have the Sermon on the Mount. You have the Sermon by the Sea, right? Jesus isn't just teaching his disciples there. He's he's teaching a larger group of people that includes his disciples, but it also includes other people who are going to hear the truth, and some are going to accept it, but some are going to reject it. Some are going to say yes. Others are going to say no. So this is the audience that he's speaking to. And all of Jesus' teachings are always accompanied by proof, by evidence, okay? It's important that we understand this. And the last thing Jesus says in his teachings is he calls for a response. And you know what's cool? Is that here we are so many years later, and do you know what Jesus still calls for? Every single day of our lives, a response. Not just here on a Sunday morning, but even even on a Sunday morning, we get done teaching the word of God to you, and guess what? We sing one final song, and we give people an opportunity to respond to the teaching of the word of God. Jesus' teaching always called for people to make a decision. Are you going to say yes, or are you going to say no? Are you going to follow me? or not? Are you going to live for me or not? You're going to love me or not? Jesus' teaching always calls for a response. So revelation, power, audience, proof, response. And we're going to see that played out over and over and over again throughout the entire book of Acts. But it's previewed for us in verses 2 and 3. So Jesus is the revelation in the Gospels. Jesus is the focal point, and God even reveals himself in and through his son, right? And, and, and Jesus reveals himself while, while he's anointed and he's empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. He's not just the written word, but he's the living word. He, he's active, he's real, he's alive. And all of this, all of this steam just continues all throughout the book of Acts, And these these teachings are going to be evidenced by this supernatural power that's only made available through the Holy Spirit of God. I I mean, it is is really going to be exciting. Let's keep reading. Verse 4. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father which he said, you heard from me. Let me pause there for just a second. What is this promise from the Father? It's the promise of the Holy Spirit of God. And and you can go back to John chapter 14 through John chapter 17, and you can see Jesus teaching his disciples about the role of the Holy Spirit of God. That yes, I'm not going to be around all the time. I'm going to leave, but I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to give you the comforter. I'm going to give you the helper. He talks about the Holy Spirit in John 14 through 17. Verse 5. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Okay? Don't be scared by that. Don't, don't get nervous. We're going to continue to talk about things that, that you maybe you know, aren't very familiar with or haven't referenced a certain thing too often in your walk with Christ. But real quick, okay, this baptism with or in the Spirit in this verse is not referencing water baptism. It's not referencing what's going to happen in two weeks. You may say, how do you know? Well, he just told us. Right? Because he just said, no, no, I'm not talking about the baptism like John did, because John baptized with water. And this baptism also isn't referencing salvation. 
This baptism with the Holy Spirit is referencing the power that is imparted upon you upon salvation. Because you now have the Holy Spirit of God living in you and through you and you have power. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. That's what the Bible talks about, okay? And and we'll talk more about this as we go throughout the book of Acts. So we see that this historical record is continuing. And the details of his teachings and his ministry are continuing. And then we see this handoff. This handoff from God to Jesus in the Gospels. And now Jesus to his disciples here in the book of Acts. And we even see the handoff continue to us today. You know what that means? His mission needs to be our mission. What was important to Jesus needs to be important to us. And we're not just going to see this in the beginning of Acts, but we're going to see this all throughout the book of Acts. How many of you enjoy movies that have a sequel? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, no, no, I should have asked this before or told you before. This is not a trick question. Okay, by raising your hand, you are not committing to work in Kids Point. Okay, you are simply answering the question how many of you enjoy a sequel to a good movie? So let's try again. How many? Okay, all right, good. All right, I'm glad we're on the same page. But if you want to volunteer for Kids Point, you're more than welcome to. Okay, now here's the deal though for the most part, you can only have a sequel if the original is not every time, but most of the time, is good enough to have a sequel, right? If the original bombs, nobody's saying, hey, let's make a sequel to that beauty, you know? Like, that's gonna get everybody out to see that. Nobody's gonna do that, right? The original has to be pretty good. Top, Top Gun Maverick is incredible, okay? But I think it's as good as it is because the original is pretty daggone good too, This is just my opinion on the next one, okay? Rocky 1 is better than Rocky 2. Rocky 3, eh. Rocky 4, incredible, should have stopped, (laughs) right? Should have stopped right after Rocky 4. Then you may say, Craig, well, why are you giving like, like a history of movies here? Well, you know what? We already said that the book of Acts is a sequel to the book of Luke. Well, guess what? Us picking up the baton and carrying out the mission of God, we are the sequel to the original act. And you know what that means? We can't bomb. We can't let it die. We can't let it just disappear. Like, we've got a responsibility to keep the mission and the movement moving forward. I mean, this original mission is incredible. This original mission of God loving us so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins so that one day when we confess and we say, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and Savior, that we get to spend an eternity in heaven with him one day. Incredible original mission. That is now our responsibility to continue, to carry on, to not fumble the ball, so to speak. The continuation of the scriptures proclaims that God has been and he continues to be on one mission, and that's to save the world. And it begs the question that everybody has to consider, are you on that mission? It calls for a response, right? Are you on that mission? Or or, do you have the desire to be about his mission? Because this mission is also going to remind us a very important truth. That it's never about us. It's about him. It's not about me and you. We play a vital part in whether or not we're going to carry the mission on or not. But the mission isn't us. It's him. It's his saving grace. It's his desire to save the world from their sins. So that, that changes the mindset, right? It's not about me. Like, am I, am I helping that mission? Is that mission important to me? Is that mission the most important thing to me? Am I helping that mission? Am I hurting that mission? 
It kind of puts everything in perspective. Have you ever thought about how you're going to carry out this mission at work, in your schools, on your sports teams, in your neighborhoods? How are you going to carry out this mission that is our mission to continue the work of the Lord Jesus Christ? Think about it this way. God didn't put any of us here on earth and God didn't save any of us just so that we could write a bad sequel with our life. Like we've got to continue this mission. We've got to carry on this movement based here in the local church. Now here's the second thing, the other thing that we see in these opening verses. Not only does continuance matter, but clarity matters. Clarity matters. And, and here we're gonna see that the mission of God through Jesus by way of the Holy Spirit is going to continue and it's going to be clear how. Because the disciples are going to be witnesses everywhere they go. Everywhere they go, they're going to talk about their Savior and the mission of their Savior, and it's going to provide clarity for every single person they come in contact with. That doesn't mean everybody's going to accept, but they are going to present a clear ministry, a clear ministry opportunity. We read in verse 6, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Pause, okay? They're asking him, Lord, since you've been crucified, since you've been resurrected, and now you've been hanging out with us off and on over the last 40 days, like, is now the time? Or are you now going to put these current rulers in their place and show them who's boss? Like, that's what they were concerned about. Like, that was the most important thing to them. So I would say that the disciples needed a little more clarity about the mission before they could start the mission because they're looking at it incorrectly. And then I love this because Jesus actually brings clarity by not totally answering their question, which probably frustrated them. When you read the Gospels, I can't tell you how many times like the disciples are like asking Jesus a question and how does Jesus respond to their question? With a question. Like Jesus was always doing that and, and that would just drive me crazy, right? If I come up to you and I ask you a question and you're like, well, you know what? And you ask me a question. I'm like, no, I asked you a question. Like answer the question. So he provides clarity, but I'm sure he doesn't give them the answer that they really want. Verse seven, he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the father has fixed by his own authority. In other words, it's none of your business. <laughs> but he doesn't stop there in verse eight. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So they're like, when is this going to happen, Lord? Like, when are we going to be able to sit back and just watch all these, all these empires just crumble and fall and really get what they deserve? Like, when is this going to take place? And Jesus is like, don't worry about that. I want you to think about this. And I want you to think about this. I want you to think about what really matters and I want you to think about things that you actually can control or be in somewhat of control through the help and the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Right? And don't worry about that. And this, this shift of focus provides clarity to them. It gives them more understanding about the mission. Do you know why this was so important? Because their internship was just about up. Because all they've ever known is being with Jesus. But Jesus is about to ascend into heaven. So the internship is up and they're about to be real life, full time workers for Jesus Christ. So they better have some clarity of the mission. They better understand what Jesus really wants them to do. 
If they had any question, all right, Jesus, you're leaving, does that mean we're calling the shots? Jesus is like, no, 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 you're not gonna be doing that. They needed some clarity. For us, the clarity is this. We serve the king of kings who not only is in control, but knows everything, especially when we don't. That's clarity. He can be trusted. He can be counted on. He can be taken at his word. He is the king of kings. I mean, you think about it. Do you, do you see what the disciples have been going through just in the last month and a half? Like, I'm not even talking about their life following Jesus and never knowing whether next meal's gonna come or how comfortable the bed's gonna be or not. But you think about them. In about a month and a half, you know, time frame, they, they saw Jesus crucified. Some of them from a great distance. <laughs> Didn't want to get too close. And I guarantee they thought, we're next. It's going to happen to us next. So they saw Jesus crucified. They saw him resurrected because he's now appearing to them over the span of 40 days. Like, they're in, a, they're in a whirlwind. I mean, things are just going a 1,000 miles an hour. Like, clarity was so important to them at this moment. Because they're like, God, what do we do? What do you want us to do? Where do you want us to go? Like, like, you're about to leave us, and we don't even know what's going on yet. And then he gives them verse 8. And I think verse 8 is probably one of the most clarifying verses in all of Scripture. In regards to, here's what I want you to do, here's how you're going to do it, and here's where you're going to do it. And he says that all in verse 8. And that's so important, because as Jesus says, hey guys, let me clear everything up for you, okay? Here's where you're going, here's what you're going to do, here's how you're going to do it. I guarantee the guys were like, Jerusalem, yes, I love Jerusalem, right? This is home, man. I can't wait to tell people about Jesus, that's great. And then he says, and Judea, and they're like, eh, not, not as excited, you know, about that. And then he says, and Samaria, and they're like, say what? <laughs> Samaria, right? All those people who hate us, all those people who have killed people, killed our loved ones, try to kill, persecute us. You mean those people? Do you know why clarity was so important about the mission to the disciples? Because they would not have gone to Samaria on their own. Why would they go there? I, I don't want to go there and practically, you know, put my life in the hands of the enemy. But he's like, all right, guys, this is not going to be done in your power because in your power, you're not going to be able to do this. So I'm going to impart the power of the Holy Spirit of God upon your life so that you can be faithful to the mission that I've called you to do. You know what all this proves? It should remind us, I hope it reminds us, that we are never, never, never going to be able to accomplish the work of God without the power of God. He can't do it. And he doesn't expect us to. He doesn't want us to even try. He's These guys are chomping at the bit, right? They're like, come on, let's go, let's go. And he goes, no, 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 don't you dare. Don't you dare go anywhere and don't you dare try one thing until I give you what I told you is gonna happen until I give you the power of the Holy Spirit. But you know what the flip side of this is and the frustrating side probably is? Is that God has given us the power of the Holy Spirit upon salvation and then we don't go. And we don't do the mission that we're called to. And, and, and can I just say this as nicely as a pastor can say this? That is wasting the power of God. If we're not only going to be called to this mission, but we're going to be obedient to this mission. Verse 9. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, 
Behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? Can we just pause there and can I just come to the defense of the disciples real quick? Really? Like that's the question you're asking me right now? Like can we just review what has happened in the last 40 days? Just real quick, okay? I know you guys are over there and you're white and you're glowing and everything and all, but, but can we just review what happened? We saw someone resurrect from the dead for the first time ever. Still a little shocked about that. And now this guy that we're watching, he's talking to us, and all of a sudden, he starts floating up into the skies. Where else are we supposed to be looking? Like, I think that's a valid reason to be staring into heaven. Like, what in the world is going on? Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking in the heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you in the heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Folks, the clarity given here is that they weren't surprised that the disciples were looking into heaven, but the clarity given here is that the disciples needed to be convinced that Jesus was coming back. That he was going to do exactly what he said he was going to do. So if we, so from Acts chapter 1 until the return of Jesus, and we don't know when the return of Jesus is going to happen, right? We don't know the day or the hour or anything like that. So what does that that mean? It means we need to be on mission because we don't know when it's going to happen. We need to be ready. We need to be working. We need to be doing our part in what God has called us to do. This this calling, this this, invitation, this movement, this mission, it didn't stop with the disciples. It continues with us. It continues with us even today. And, And this whole, this thought of being on mission for God. Like I know there are people Jeff Stockard, who was thinking of the Blues Brothers right now, you know, like, I'm on mission for God, and he's going to tell me after church, hey, the Blues Brothers, right? And if you weren't thinking about that, you are now, and I'm sorry. But we cannot let this mission stop. We've got responsibility. We've got jobs to do. Now, let me just list for you real quickly. We're not going to reread the verses, but I just want to list for you the key points of clarity from this text. And you can write these down, fill these in if you want. You don't have to. It's all good. There's clarity of authority in verse 7. Verse 8 has a few different things. There's clarity of power in verse 8. There's clarity of a calling in verse 8. And there's clarity of direction in verse 8. There's a clarity of confirmation in verses 9 and 10. And there's a clarity of urgency in verse 11. Okay? The, all of this so far proves to us in these first 11 version, this, this first 11 verses is that the continuation of God's mission is so important. And the clarity of God's mission is so important. Because if you don't have a clarity of what God's called you to do, how can the mission continue? It can't continue. Do you care enough about the people in your family, at your work, in your neighborhood, at your schools? Do you care enough about those people to say, I'm joining the mission? I'm on mission. I'm on mission with my life. I want to be counted on as being faithful to the calling that God has placed in my life where we're going out and we are representing Jesus Christ and we are talking about this incredible original message of how much God loves and how much God has a desire to save to a world that now more than ever before desperately needs Jesus. Are you willing to join that mission. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for today. I thank you for the truth of the word of God. 
And God, I thank you for the fact that this book is still, it's so relevant. It's so applicable. And it is alive and active and it's powerful and it cuts and it does everything that you want it to do. So God, as we now get to the point in our service where you call for a response, God, my prayer each and every week is the same, that we would be obedient to the Holy Spirit of God. Whatever the Holy Spirit is revealing to us is calling us to, that God, we would say yes. Because so many amazing things happen after we say yes. So God, please take this word, the continuation of this word, and may it resonate on our hearts, not just throughout the rest of the day, but as we enter into another week. And God, may we just be obedient to the Holy Spirit of God. So you instruct, we listen, we obey, we do. So God, just continue to have your hand upon everybody in the service today, those watching online, those who will watch this service sometime in the future. May your will be done in each and every one of our hearts and lives. We ask all these things in your, in your son's precious and holy and wonderful name. Amen. I want to invite you to stand with me if you would, please. And this is the response. This is the call to respond. Not to me, not to Bridgepoint Church, but through what the Holy Spirit of God did with the word of God today. If he's laid anything on your heart, if he's calling you to anything, if, he, if you need to pray about something, you need to pray for someone, with someone, who, whatever it is, just be obedient to the Holy Spirit. So you come as we sing.